Okay, so we're recording here. So we're here with Troy Martz learning about the gasifier. That's a primary focus here. But I was saying that last year we did a, not last year, it was 2014, we did a gasifier. We ran our power cube successfully, basically started right up. It was charcoal based, very simple system, a hearth and a big container and little blower to start it. And then some exhaust gas recirculation and just a butterfly valve to get it into the engine intake, the air intake. But it was surprisingly easy and we want to just continue with that. We're going to use um, a 16 horsepower engine this year and we want to do that with that. But uh, Troy, I want to just learn everything we can from you regarding the gasifiers and what to do. Like, so you mentioned the 3D printed hearth. Maybe, maybe we should start with that. Yeah. Well, um, so as with any product and any prototype, you, you have the product that you have and you have the product that you're working on. You have yeah. Think of yeah. So this falls in the I was thinking about it category. Uh, I know it would work because it's empirical science and physics. But it, essentially, the idea was with gasification, you're dealing with some areas of the unit being extremely hot. Mm -hmm. And one of the few materials that can withstand that type of heat is I think, ceramic, um, mm -hmm. alumina, zirconia based. Um, and so I got to thinking that a lot of the gasifier core design, mm -hmm. the airflow, uh, the nozzle system, all of those dynamics, um, which is a lot of fab time, mm -hmm. right? and, and metal is just a fantastic material, but in some cases it's not the best material. Right. So what I was thinking is, what if you could 3D print uh, a high temperature ceramic hearth or a gas fire, which is mm -hmm. essentially the hottest part of the gas fire. And I got to thinking, I was like, well, you could print more than a hearth. You could print the whole nozzle assembly and exhaust gas, just bake it right, right in, just like any complicated 3D drawing. Mm -hmm. And so, of course, you have to understand gasification enough to be able to start messing around with the design in your head or on paper. And I started thinking, well, if I was going to do that, I would have like a, a thick wall gas fire heart. Just think of it maybe a five gallon bucket, something about that size. Mm -hmm. And But it's thick walled, so you might have two inch thick or an inch and a half ceramic walls. It's hollow. Mm -hmm. It's hollow because it's going to be some of the, the airways, the passageways, the nozzles will be going through there. So you have, you know, the best gasification systems in, in my mind. Um, are ones that utilize waste heat, or the waste heat is utilized somewhere in a closed system. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, you can't you can't have it. <laughs> there's there's a there's a fine line between practical and ideal. So, um, you know, that being said, um, a ceramic gasifier would be would have to be protected. So it'd have to like sit in maybe a metal box, padded or placed in there securely. Um, and then you could have metal pipes basically coming off. Mm -hmm. But the part that's going to have the most metal fatigue would be ceramic and wouldn't experience the kind of shrinkage and expansion and, and overall by using metal in the core, which just about every gas fire that I know is, has metal in the core. Uh huh. So this is really no different than like Dan's. Like, I don't know if you guys used a 55 gallon barrel and put bricks in the bottom. Yeah, we used we actually welded a, a rectangular container and put the fire bricks at the bottom. Yeah, so there, it, that was your insulation to protect from metal fatigue on the bottom of that box. So it lasts. Yeah, I've seen I've seen some and just recently did a did a course down in Veracruz at Las Cadenas where um, we had a gas fire that uh, uh, there was a couple areas that got really hot even from the outside they got red hot and. Uh, just sort of further cemented my idea that it is possible to have one that's safe. And just so you know, it's a, 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 a 3D printed ceramic part, um, not, the, not the kiln aspect of it, although that's not too expensive, is going to be cheaper than a metal one, especially if you own the printer. Yeah. I already priced all this out two years ago when it was really cutting edge. And they only had one company now that was five or six manufacturing kind of technology. Oh, manufacturers but, of actual hearths for gasifiers? No, of 
the high temperature ceramic 3D printers. Okay. Yeah, and so really neat videos. Out. There's one I think from Caltech. So at one of the schools in California, where a guy's holding a piece in his bare hand, and he's got a blowtorch three inches away on the ceramic, and he's not letting go of his hand because of the properties of the ceramic. So Very nice. Include some of those on the inner lining. Or you just the whole heart that's maybe maybe uh maybe not a super high temperature but a uh, one of those uh, practical decisions. You go with the slightly cheaper, less heat resist. It's still going to be better than metal. So maybe you ask, um, can you use just normal clay? Well, sure. I, at least I think you asked that, Martin. Didn't before we started recording? Did you say could you use just available clay? Uh, yeah. Okay. The answer is yes, but if you're with any kind of pottery, you have different kinds of clay, different kinds of characteristics, platelets. And, yeah. Um, and I'm not a, a potter, so I could give you the. But I do know that even some of the worst clays um, would be brittle, but would, at least from a heat resistance standpoint, be better than metal. Right? So, could you use uh, available? Clay, yeah, I would try it. It just depends if your kiln can vitrify the clay versus getting it not quite to the point of vitrification. And right. vitrification, it passes it... up and becomes yeah, um, like one of those fancy pots you see in the garden. Yeah, waterproof. It, it got well past two thousand degrees C. Troy, tell me, tell me just for a second. So, if I wanted to build one of these three D printers. Are there any th designs available in open source? For the ceramic? Yeah. 3D printer? Well, yeah. yeah, you know far more about 3D printing than I. I believe it's the nozzle setup that makes it special. Right, right. right? XYZ axis um, controllers and servo motors. I think it should be any brand. Um, now, that being said, the people when I, that I spoke to, and I have, I'll, I'll find the info for you. It's a Kansas City company, actually, not too far from you, um, that's, that was selling the printer. Oh, really? It was like $3,000, I believe. Huh. It was not open source. Do you, you, you know the company name? No, but let me bring up um, huh. Google because I didn't search too hard to find this stuff. But you said their their design is not open source? I don't remember, but I don't... Because when I called them, I said, Hey, can I outsource? I mean, do you guys do printing? Ceramic printing? Oh, yes, we do. Um, okay, well, can I order some gas fire heart? And we had this long talk, and he basically can... I came to the conclusion that it would be worth my while just to buy one. Right? And I remember in my head it being around $3,000 and thinking, wow, that was not much more than a normal plastic uh, 3D printer. But this one was the clay, and you know what makes it high temperature is not really the extruder, it's the material. Right. Um, so I really don't know how critical it is to have, um, but I'll tell you what, you know, let me send you some links um, when I find them. I yeah. I have to look at the time I was recording. Yeah. Um, I know there's certainly some activity going on at open source, and I'm not sure if a really robust open source version is out there or not. I know that there's some definitely some proprietary ones that are working very well. But that, but this is excellent because that totally extends the range of materials. Of course, you have to bake it, but it extends the range of materials for regular 3D printing, meaning that much many more people, more than natural types, will be interested in 3D printing. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Oh, and it's such a it's such a critical tool for for the future. I mean, it, yeah, uh, I think you would recognize that. Yeah, I'll, absolutely, I'll, absolutely. Anything. Now, just to, just while we're on this topic, I also happen to know a guy named Tom Schaefer who's heading up or he's in sales with one of the metal the three D metal printers. Tom Schaefer. So, uh, Tom Schaefer. Yeah, and I'll I'll. Uh, I sent you a link to the working document. I'm taking notes here. Oh yeah, if you have a like a, a forum or something, I could leave all this in the comment thread. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I just 
pasted that uh, link in the chat box if you want to hit the chat box, which is the box on the left hand side there. You can look at the chat. But I'll, I can send this to you by email later. Yeah, keep going. Yeah, moving on. So, um, so to wrap up the three D printer, um, the ceramic printing with gasification cores as the application, or rocket stuff, you know, anything where high mm -hmm. heat. Um, although I think gasification has a better use for it. It's well, this is thing. you know, Troy. This is just perfect because you know we're talking. You know, printer three D printers are part of the ecology, and I. Uh, this is new to me that we just discovered new product ecology and that is the 3d printer plus gasifier that's awesome yeah absolutely yeah and, and really i mean you can as you know what determines how much gas flow that comes out of the gasifier is largely based on uh the pipe diameter size yeah if you're dealing with one inch pipe there's only so much gas you can pull through that before it really starts to heat up and you start getting into the fluid dynamic aspects of that with friction that you see on cyclone filters because because of the speed of the, of the air on cyclone filters. So the same thing, you know, and also it takes energy to pull on on, on a, you know, a pipe that has um, pressure drop or resistance. Uh -huh. so, so with this printed core, you're really shortening all the pipe lengths. You're baking them in. Again, you have to protect the core. So just imagine you have a hard shell protector <laughs> yeah this thing but but if you could especially in villages that, that might not you know, have the resources or are far away from resources um you really could just print it the whole gas fire right there as long as you have maybe a couple of pipes i mean really that's simple yeah that's awesome that's just awesome yeah mm -hmm. I, i'm down here in mexico as you know yeah I'm up, I'm up in the hills and i live in a, in a very small town for the reason because uh, this is where I wanted to go because I could, I could utilize this technology. And I know people around here that we've talked about this, uh, they wouldn't or couldn't spend even on junk, but they could build uh, you know, a clay oven and a clay kiln just with their hands. And that would work just fine. Yeah. There's only a, key, a few key points on a gas fire that determine the quality of Four or five locations. The rest are just kind of, um, in my opinion, um, are just sort of connectors for those key dots. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So if you, um, I mean, so that was the ceramic part. Um, now, just because the concept sounds good doesn't mean that the design will be good. I happen to think the design that's been rolling over in my head would work. Um, I, I don't have it drawn, and I certainly don't have it in 3D. I have it spread across four notebooks, probably. Uh, could you maybe do something like take some some pictures of the key design, just various figures, and we can kind of discuss those later? Yeah, um, with, you know, remember that the, the ceramic part was really just rough idea phase. Uh-huh. So, so... Yeah, I mean, I could. There's really not much to show other than me trying to think through something in 3D space in my head, trying to draw it in 2D space and see if it would work. Right. And, uh, so maybe, perhaps I the... could explain it. Okay. I could explain it, and I can draw several, uh, several simple diagrams to explain different aspects. Of Why don't you do that? I will. I have, I have a lot of commitment, so I can't guarantee it's going to be done. Okay. Well, do you want to just uh, briefly describe the main bullet points of what what that design includes? Yeah. So, well, with charcoal gasification, as you know, it really doesn't matter if the air jet sucking in the outside air is pointed up, down, sideways. It doesn't matter. With biomass gasification, it absolutely does matter because one of the only ways to make it work is to turn it down for the undraft gas. But charcoal, we're not trying to solve both problems. We're not 
trying to pyrolyze raw wood and remove it with water content and the tar gas yeah. and all the carboxyl compounds. We, we already have the finished product. So that's yeah. kind of um, that's kind of a nice thing to have. And so if you can get to that point and you have char, then you have to size it. And what I've come into from running charcoal gas fires, not as often as other people, but especially like guys like Gary Gilmore that walk the walk and live it. Uh, most of my experience comes with all those hours of prototyping and doing, doing uh, talks, courses. So, but from what I've noticed is that you know, with the charcoal gas fire, with fuel type and fuel size, let's talk about that for a minute. Uh-huh. Because I mean, if we're talking about um, anywhere in the world, then different rules apply. So if you're in, let's say, the cold temperate where you're at, um, you know, we're looking at hardwoods. Because I don't know if there's a lot of biomass that could be um, dried. I mean, you're in the plain state, right? Yeah, the I mean, there's plenty of haying going on. Now, hay's not the best choice. So let's talk right. about carbon. Um, especially with charcoal gas fires, our fuel is carbon, and the, the, the least mineral-dense carbon is the most pre preferable. So if you can find yeah. um, certain hardwoods that are very low in mineral content, that means there's very little ash, and it also means there's very little clinker, which doesn't really happen in charcoal gas vegetation like it does in biomass vegetation. I haven't really come across any clinker problems. And if any design would have clinker problems, it would have been our grass iron design, which was just a, a 10 inch pipe that was 4 feet tall, right on the inside. So if there's ever a place for clinker, it would be that. And what I found was that there was, it just never happened. So uh, there were sort of like these little loose, almost like earth pods um, that would form, but we were pleasantly surprised with, you know, with that, uh, with just the, simple, uh, the simplicity of charcoal gas mutation. So let's get back to the, the fuel type. Yeah. So if you have a brush, like low quality brush or new growth forest that's, yeah. that you don't find bushwhacking or- Definitely, or, we've got that. Wet, yes. The, I would recommend cutting it under one inch in diameter. Right? And I would cut it like, like you do bananas. If you have a wood chipper, you know, there's, I, again, I don't know what else um, you might have on your plate for, for a machine to essentially process wood. But I know in my world, especially, I would have a wood chipper, I would have a hammer mill, and I would have a pellet mill. Because that gives me, both, now that's a lot of money. I mean, right there, that's at least 10 grand in, in machine costs at retail. Maybe maybe half of that if we, if we did sort of a, you know, part of the global village construction set of it. I know, I know there's some of those uh, instruments that are already on the list, but with gasification, I'm always thinking, do I have lots of wood? Is there a lot of um, hardwood scrap? If I'm in the Pacific Northwest, there's all kinds of sawdust. I mean, they can't get through the wood fast enough. And in places like Southern California, you can't find it. Um, which was my talk in Permaculture Voices too, like you, to choose the right alternative technology, energy technology for where you're at. And back to gasification. We just did a Haiti um, uh, presentation. There was uh, a company called, I think it's called Claritas. Claritas. It's a NGO, and they're working with the sugarcane plantation in Haiti. And what they wanted to do in Haiti was uh, use the spent the gas of the sugarcane dry it, chip it, then pulverize it with a hammer mill. So you're basically left with a sawdust-like material from spent sugar cane. Then they wanted to pelletize it and then sell those pellets as a business on Haiti for fuel, which they're running low on, without using, without using uh, perennials. This is all, well, sugar canes. Without using uh, woody biomass or trees, now, that's interesting, and they would use the rest of it to power the whole plant. So they're not even using the alcohol for ethanol. 
there is enough biomass in sugarcane for gas to use it to power the whole plant and to sell the leftovers to make a product. That's, that can only be done um, you know, with a hammer mill, with a pelletizer. What I love about pellets is they're so dense, they're almost as dense as a coconut shell, which is the densest form of natural carbon uh, that I know. Of. And the density of the carbon is great because, as you know, it's just a more compacted form of molecules. And, and really, when you're making syngas, it's all about surface area. It's all about surface area. And I'm absolutely confident of it because there's a Goldilocks size that works with the gasifiers that we were practicing with. Just put up the 10, the 10 kilowatt size, your, your bigger Home Depot size generator. Yeah. And, um, yeah, it's just, uh, well, I think I'm getting off on a hand. So I guess what I'm saying is no matter where you live, it's either hardwood or pellets. Or pellets. Or you can yeah, pellets. absolutely. Now, if I had a choice and wasted energy wasn't part of the equation, I'd ask the pellets every time because Agreed. they flow well. That's bridge. global. It's flowable like gasoline. They flow almost <laughs> as close to gasoline as possible. They're like marbles. It's just yeah. amazing. They might almost reminds me of, of hydrogen for the aquaponic growers. Those little play balls. You could literally just jab your hands at them. They move to the side. It's, it's so yep, yep. With, with wood chips, um, bridging is always going to be a problem. You're That's right. Gonna get that's why you always want to have if you're gonna if you're gonna run um, charcoal that was made from wood chips you're gonna have irregular charcoal so we got to screen it and in my very very strong opinion you don't want anything smaller than a rice grain you don't want anything bigger than a sugar cane. if it's smaller than a rice grain it's too small anyway uh, it, maybe not for a uh, certain kinds of gas technology where you have a suspended charcoal powder and it's you know but for the kind of gasifiers we're talking about anything smaller than a rice grain is better used as biochar anyway it's going to cause a problem in the gas fire because it's a little too small it's not going to let the the gas flow through it right so that this is really a delicate dance between surface area so let's use a cigarette analogy Someone, if someone rolled a very loose cigar, it's going to burn very quickly, right? There's your bamboo. There's your, uh, you know, some of your more pumicey type of woods. And, um, you know, so getting back to the smaller pieces, sugar, you know, if you have a sugar cube type thing, with wood chips, sometimes that looks more like a pink, you know, long skinny or half of a thick head. It's like four inches long, and you you know it, it fell through the, the sieve because it was the right size. But it, so you get all these different um, scenarios where bridging can occur. Um, not so much with charcoal because especially if you roll the fuel around around the edges, it'll flow well. Um, but this all comes with. I mean, charcoal is a really really hard sell. It's really easy to sell when the machines in front of you and people are like, oh look, it's amazing. We, well, there's so much that goes up to that point, including food fuel prep, so if you're prepping the fuel on site, I would strongly recommend that a farm plan have fuel prep, you know, as part of the plan, and as, it, as you're prepping fuel and it moves its way down the trough, probably closer to use, um, yeah. you know, the sieving and the rounding of the fuel could be easily done if it was, if it was as part of the routine, right? Now, if you're out camping and something, who's going to do that? So, Gonna put it in fire. But at any at any rate, um, charcoal is amazing. I'll never go back to biomass. Um, right. Uh, and also, I would I would highly recommend you also consider besides the exhaust gas recirculation is the steam and the steam reformation. And I'll tell you why. Now, guys like Gary and Dan and and, and others, um, as you know, will will port a certain percentage of exhaust gas back into the air nozzle of the gas fire. Dan, you're talking about Dan's workshop? 
yeah, Dan's workshop. It's just the yeah. exhaust gas recirculation, and there's you know a bunch of guys that do it. Even All Power Labs, I think, even does it. Uh, Gary Gilmore certainly does it. Uh, uh-huh. he's, he's the first one I see doing it. And uh, just for any anybody is that listening, is that primarily yeah. for recycling some of the unburnt fuel? No. Or it's for cooling off. It's for it's it's to act as a cooling agent. Not technically a cooling agent. It's to act as a buffer to slow down the chemical reaction between two two elements. So in other words, if you have an inert gas like argon or carbon dioxide, which is what's coming out of that gas pipe, or even nitrogen, right? Um, and you put it with a gas, and as you know, with the gas law, all gases fill the spaces. So you have basically a diluted gas if you want to think of it that way. Not, I don't know if it's Why don't you, let me ask you this on that yeah. on that point, why don't you just make the air aperture for the gasifier smaller so you don't get as fast a burn? Well, so, so with gasification, you know, as you know, you're only going to get almost exactly half the power you would off of gas. Right? Okay. You got a 10 kilowatt generator, you're going to get five. Five usable ones, uh, kilowatts. And same with horsepower, right? So it's about half. Now, you can get a little bit north of half by doing a couple things. One is trying to cool your gas as much as possible before it goes into the, into the unit. So that's condensing the gas. You get more flammable molecules in a smaller space that way. So if you're in Missouri and you have the luxury of maybe putting some piping underground so to cool that gas down to ambient temperatures um there's more power going into you know going into your engine um because you have a denser gas so yeah. really that's the function of um pulling in that gas so it'll burn is it's purely a function of what's the cubic centimeter air displacement of that engine it's the old cc they got a 350 cc well it's 350 cubic centimeters of displacement Revolution. Okay, so it's it's a way to think of it, you know. And you know how fast a revolution is on something. Like, that's three point five liters in, in a revolution. So it's a lot of. You yeah. Imagine how much that's sucking in gas. Now here's where here's where you get the dilution factor with gasification. Once you pull the gas into the gas fire, it was already diluted to begin with to make the carbon monoxide and hydrogen. And as it gets right close towards the engine, then you have to put oxygen back into the mix to make it reflammable. Because the first time you put an oxygen was the process of making the gas in the first place. So it's sort of, you know, the nitrogen that we breathe is about 80%. Well, it's less now, but it's about 17% around us. Hitches a ride into the gasifier when we suck in gas. If we had a plasma gasification system and we could pull in pure oxygen, you would have 8,000 degree reactions with plasma torches in there, which is what happens. And it melts out. They can throw in everything and put a, a truck engine in there, right? And it just turns into slag because they'll get all the sim gas of any living carbonaceous fuel that comes with, let's say, mini- municipal waste. But anything that's mineral will just turn into slag and they'll make it an asphalt. Well, we don't have that kind of temperatures with small cell or farm scale gasification. We don't have that technology or that budget you can play around if you want to get some oxygen tank and, and melt some metal quick <laughs> you know that's fun but it's not going to be much so um in a perfect world if gas if oxygen was being pushed through the air nozzle in a gas fire to begin with it would have prevented the mix. and then if we were mixing it with oxygen right near the air intake it would have never been diluted a second time so what you would have is a very violent explosion and you would have to get the top dead center all right you know some of the newer motors that have computers that self-adjust do that well of course that's when again we're talking farm scale some of this technology is not available for that but um, you know my my point is honestly march and i forgot my point because you got me rambling no the no, no, I'm just simply asking why can't you make the aperture, air aperture smaller for the gasifier you instead can. of cooling it? Well, you can. Now, 
if you have an engine that's pulling really hard and on the other end is a tiny aperture, yeah. you're going to get really, really high velocity speed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so that's good. That's good. You want to get high velocity. You want 25 meters per second speed at the nozzle. That's, that's, the, that's the magic Goldilocks speed of the air nozzle. And, and this is 100-year-old science. And in my classes, I actually pull up the charts uh, where the Royal Air Force gentleman that wrote, wrote the book has all these chart notes. So the airspeed and the nozzle aperture. So I stole all that from history and borrowed some ideas from Gary Gilmore and Kuhn Van Looken and some guys that were really on the edge. And that's all I did. I, I mean, nothing really was new as far as, you know, what, what we built. Um, just sort of the assembly was unique. Nothing really that was you know, even worthy of, of uh, patent technology. Now, the, the printed ceramic gasifier core absolutely does have the potential to be, because that's a game changer. You can mass produce that without a human, without a welder. I know there's robots that well, but um, this, this just lends itself better. It, it, it's, it could be a game changer. Yeah. Um, so if the open source hardware world wants to grab a hold of it um, soon, you know, somebody else might jump on it if that's a worry. I don't even know if that's a worry for you. Um, but at any rate, <clears throat> they seem to be trying to patenting everything. Days, like right like <laughs> so why not sure anyway. yeah yeah no I mean we definitely want to get our hands on it to make it available to everybody now so does that answer the question on why you need the... the aperture well let me finish that yeah so yeah let's say I had a pinhole and I have I have a tractor that needs to move a thousand cubic centimeters or five thousand you know it's a big track yeah that pinhole is, you know, you're only going to get up to a certain speed before things start going haywire, before it just doesn't go anywhere. And um, so there's, and also it takes energy to pull against that kind of resistance. Right. So you have, again, it's a, it's drawing the line in the sand with um, hotter, smaller aperture and hotter gas is better because you get more uh, full uh, complete reaction. Uh, with the oxidation or reduction process. But you don't want to have it so tight, like it's a really hard pack cigar where you're really trying to pull through it. It takes too much energy. You want to find the Goldilocks zone where you do have to pull on it, but you get about 25 meters per second speed on this nozzle. You can measure that if you want to go through the time to do it. But it sounds like to me, everything that we've talked to to this point are things to put on the record, but are not what you're trying to work on currently. Is that correct? Are you, Mark, are you still there? Yeah, I'm, I'm here. No, you're asking, um, I mean, um, are you asking a question? Yeah, uh, is the current, or your current goal at this point is the tractor mounted to run the power decks? Yeah, yeah, it is, it is. Okay. It would These be... other questions are just sort of framing something that they come Right, because the, the idea is to generate the charcoal for heating in the winter and use that charcoal in the summer for tractors and things. Well, let's talk about that. Let's, cause I, I can throw a couple layers on that that I think you'd be excited about. Uh -huh. If you have a charcoal gas fire, not a biomass effort, but you're running charcoal, the byproduct is going to be CO2 h So carbon dioxide and water. So if the tailpipe of your generator happens to be sticking in a greenhouse. Right, right. Not only are you putting in CO2, which farmers pay a lot of dollars for CO2 generator machines that also take electricity, you're getting, that's a, it's a waste product out of the tailpipe, but it's completely, I love breathing in the tailpipe air when we're doing gasification workshops because there's no smell whatsoever. Water and CO2 don't smell. Right. Any smell is from what was running before it. It's, it's a lovely thing. You smell it, you're like, hmm. You know, diesel will smell like the oil that was used to cook whatever food you know, if you're doing biodiesel. But with gasification, it just smells like more air, like the dryer. And uh, it's a neat thing to show people. They're like, oh, yeah. Who wants to smell a gasoline tailpipe? Well, that's not a problem with gasification. 
and the big inefficiency, you know, that's why I like to look at a classification as a perfect player in a holistic content, a context because there's weight streams just before it and just after it. And the just after it is the CO2 and water vapor. So if, you're, if, you have a, you know, if you have a house, you don't want to probably don't want to put CO2 in your house, but um, you could suck the heat off a pipe that was going through the house and then fed the CO2. You know, if you want to drip the water vapor, there's not going to be enough to garden anyway. It's just sort of, uh, you know, it's not enough. But right. the CO2 um, is plenty enough. I mean, just think it's the same amount that your engine is sucking in. So it's, you could literally, now don't do it at night. Because at night, oxygen will take in oxygen. You only want to run it during the day. And that's when plants will breathe in carbon dioxide. So you are eliminating something that would cost hundreds of dollars for a professional grower who's trying to get as much carbon dioxide into the greenhouse as possible. So if you can take the heat off that exhaust pipe, you're recapturing energy. And if you can pipe that CO2 where it can do good, either a greenhouse or what Willie Smith is doing in, in Borneo is he's got, he's using the CO2 for algae, sort of bubbling it with algae to grow it up, which is pretty novel. Um, but for a farmer, a greenhouse is a no-brainer because that's pretty common. That's, that's what I would do with the gas. I would have, you know, the generator pretty close to where I needed it. Now, if it's a mobile generator, obviously it's a different publication. But yeah. Stationary generator, um, you know, I would probably even consider, you know, building a brick gas pump. I wouldn't spend $3,000 on sheet metal and material like that. I would just build a brick gas pump. Remember, because there's only four or five connector points in a gas fire that really matter. The air nozzle, the you know, the pipe diameter, obviously the filtration. But at the end of the day, if you get cold clean gas, it doesn't matter if you put it with bricks or steel. It really doesn't. You know, so if you're talking about, um, you know, getting something into production that produces a lot of power, you could almost build a brick gasifier that would power the whole farm. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> For maybe a thousand, fifteen hundred dollars in material. Or make your own um, earth bricks. You know, and then you have your labor. So I love where all this is going because um, if you can recapture some of the weight to heat, then gasification actually makes has a higher ROI than solar panels. Mm-hmm. So but you have to you have to literally take all of what it's giving you from the whole chain before you can make that claim. Otherwise solar panels are just are so awesome it's hard to beat them but uh, gasification is one technology yeah all we had for i mean we didn't have any fancy nozzles in our system all we had was a pipe going into the the chamber which is yeah. the just the refractory chamber there mm -hmm. now with dan's system you have to understand dan built that with the context of how cheap he could get something that would buy right so what did he get a 55 gallon metal drum I mean, I, well, at least in his unit, I know you guys did something a little different. But in his unit, it was a 55 metal drum, a brick liner for insulation, and a pipe literally laying on the bricks. Yeah. Will it work? Absolutely. Absolutely, it'll work. And with enough, you know, filtration, I know Dan was just kind of wrapping some foam around. I would take it a few extra lengths to make sure that it was really clean gas, so my, my engine would be a primary concern just to make sure that no charcoal particles or get into the engine. Um, you can still burn them away, just better not to do it. Um, at any rate, um, Dan's system is gasification at its simplest, it's viable, it works. Is it the most, um, is it the most efficient? No, it can't be. Because you can't be the most efficient and the least expensive and the best, you know, it's like good, fast, cheap, pick two. You know, so with Dan's, if you're going to, you know, because he's not spending a lot of money on some of the better gadgetry and some of the better materials, that's the whole point. The whole point was, look what you can do with cheap materials. So my, my only point is, is with 3D printing, obviously a bad nozzle and a 
good dog look and ceramic print it doesn't make a damn bit of difference to the printer than yeah. it will in the performance of the machine. Um, right. You know, Let me ask you this so we can focus the discussion. On October 27th through the 29th, we'll be hosting the, the tractor build here. What I was going to do at that time was just to replicate the basics of what we have done, just to show that it works and, you know, you get reasonable performance out of that. So if we were to do a simple chamber or like what, what, what is feasible within the next two months, uh, can we focus the discussion for that? Like, I, mean, I don't think we're going to have the 3D printer by that time, nor the design completed. But uh, what what is practical right now to improve over what we had last time? Well, I didn't see what you built last time. I only heard about it. Yeah. So can you describe it, what it looked like? Or... Right. It's all pictures, but... If you look at this, okay, um, can I send you a link into the chat box? Can you click on it so you can look at, or, or you want me to share my screen? Uh, share your screen. I have the link, too. Okay. Well, here's the gasifier. All it was, it was a box uh, with a four-way T exhaust gas recirculation. There was a hearth with a, just a pipe sticking into it. We had a cyclone, which was a simple um, extinguisher, just a, just a cylinder, and then the pipe going into the flare and then to the intake, and we had a butterfly valve at the air intake. So that's this is essentially what we did, just a rectangular container. You can see some of the images right. here. Yeah. yeah. That's great. That's, that's really, 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 really nice design. Yeah. yeah. I don't see anything with this that I would change. Okay. Because this, because this isn't what Dan did in his garage. What he did with you is far more professional looking. I mean, that's nice. Yeah. So the only thing is the air intake just wanted to, last time we just did just, just like a little flapper. It has to be pretty precise because we were, that had to be open a very certain way. So I guess the only two points I would question is, okay, how do we do, well, one, we want to add a filter to this. Um, yeah, definitely. I've seen no filter here. So there's just a cyclone. What would you suggest for a filter? Is what? Perlite. Perlite. Yeah, it's, it's the little white crystal. Yeah, yeah. No, I know. Thing. Yeah. There's, it's cheap. It, it has massive surface area to catch all those microscopic charcoal particles and ash particles. Okay. You can wash it and it's reusable. It's just, it's like, it was meant for this. Oh, wow. So what I would do is I would put it in some sort of a cylinder where the gas comes in at the bottom. It has to fight gravity and the surface area of the perlite to even have a chance so literally a few inches up and there's nothing coming in everything's dropping out uh -huh. um, but i've only had uh one opportunity to try it I had zero problems with it and my excitement came from the fact that hey i can reuse this and if it ever gets too bad i can literally just take propane torch to it and burn off any charcoal oh wow resin. yeah <laughs> it's, it's mineral it's like vermiculite so perlite is what i would use um gary gilmore uses just a wool blanket now, so you don't want to put that where it's real hot but he just folds up a wool blanket like maybe 10 times and just just tucks it in on top of whatever his other filter medium whether it's hay or you know you can use hay i just like perlite because it's not inorganic, it's reusable, it doesn't matter what temperature it gets to, and it's got such a ma massive surface area that it allows for flood. Gary Here's Gilmore, you said he used rock wool? Uh, just wool, just regular sheep wool. Blankets. Regular wool. Where's mine? Hmm. I'm sure he, you know, Gary's always messing around with something, so he's got, I mean, the guy's got loads of gas fires and stuff just laying around in place. And, uh, Isn't a... Uh... Isn't the gas still pretty hot at that time? Uh, yeah, well, it depends, you know, again, it depends on how long is your piping. So if you were, let's say, looking at this drawing here, and looking at your cyclone, um, you know, and you'd have to look at where is this going, on what, what system is this going to sit on, and then I would say, what room do we have for what shape of, of heat? So it might not be a, it might not be 
like a long cylinder. You might have another box. Right? If you have a box, it's okay. Just make sure you put in your dirty gas on the opposite corner. So down to the left and it comes up to the corner. Okay. Get as much uh, travel time as you can. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so perlite sounds great to me. And how do you separate it? Like, do you have like a mesh at the inlet and outlet? So yeah, I mean, if you want to do a simple perlite um, filter, what I would do is go get something like a, well, I would say like a four inch aluminum pipe that's going to be too flimsy for. Well, okay, so you don't four, get a four inch metal pipe. Four inch metal so pipe. Sort of, fill it, and maybe it's three feet tall. If you can get something bigger, um, again, we're talking about really hot gas, so it probably has to be metal. I was going to say, you know, plastic is probably not going to cut it. Um, you know, if you can get thin walled, because you don't need thick walled, um, thin walled, big tubing, yeah. it would be just awesome. Then fill it up with perlite. You have like some sort of a catch at the bottom, um, just like you do uh, on the gas fire here. See yeah. how the exhaust gas. So just like that, you have, um, you know, where your dirty gas is going in, you have hot, dirty gas, your cyclone took out 90% of the particulate matter, but you still got the 10%. And now it's going into the bottom of your media filter, mm -hmm. um, and it's traveling upward, sideways, doesn't matter. Um, I, I like upwards because gravity is a good friend when you try to filter. Yeah. Um, so if you're going to go up, then take the gas off the top. And Okay. And if you want to have your butterfly valve as close to the air intake as possible, you don't want to you want to have it literally as close as possible. Which in the drawings it it's correct. Valve as close to air intake as possible. Yep. Yeah. And what happens if it's farther away? It do, just doesn't serve that pun fun doesn't function well, right? Just if what? If the butterfly valve is farther away from the air intake. Truthfully, um, the truth is that I was told that by two different people. I don't know why. And Gary Gilmore was one, and the other one was Jim Mason from All Power Labs, two of the most respected people in all field gas station. I never said why, and I always just assumed that you'd get um, more turbulence and more of a stoichiometric mix. Whereas if it's if it's mixed further down the trough, then you might get some gas settling, which doesn't make obviously doesn't make sense. Thermodynamic, uh, yeah, Charles Law or whatever it is. Um, so I don't know. I don't you know just get better mixing people. when it's close up, close to it. You don't know why. Yeah, I kind of, it kind of makes sense logically, but um, maybe not rationally, but logic. Uh. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, and, and you know as well as I do, this will still work even if all the stuff is a little bit wrong. It'll yeah. Still work. I'm yeah. just trying to paint a picture of like an ideal machine. Yeah. So, um, yeah, so after you come out of the media filter, your gas will be a little bit cooler and a lot cleaner. So the cyclone filter is a must have. That's, that's just a gift from the universe. We filter the material with a vortex. But you still need to filter that last 10% per light. In my opinion, you might want to try vermiculite. I haven't tried it. Mm -hmm. um, perlite worked really well with a one time I did it, I was really happy with it. And uh, like I said, I didn't see any black. The only where it was coming in, three, four inches up, it was clean as a whistle, and I ran it for hours. So that tells me both my, my cyclone filter was pretty well, and also perlite probably had something to do with it. How well does a cyclone filter work if it's uh, just a cylinder? Just a cylinder. So without Steven the taper, Adesa does it just a cylinder. He doesn't taper the nose. Yeah. And that's and that's exactly what I do. Just okay. Cut on fab time. Yeah, yeah. I, I I thought it worked great. Every time that I unscrewed the bottom uh, ash trap, if you will, I, I had just loads of just microscopic carbon dust. And you got to be careful because it's really it's really light. You don't you know, get particles floating around in the air. Um, Mine worked great, and it's a Stephen Abadessa model design. Now, if you go to Bill Pence, P E N T Z, BillPence.com, Bill that is the single 
facto source for efficiency when it comes to cycling. Here's a guy who had lung damage from being a woodworker and literally got obsessed with the technology. Yeah. You go to his site, everything you'll ever want to know about cycling filters and all their variations will be there. Huh. It's a really great reason. So if you have a, a, a cyclone that's one foot high, let's say, would the pipes, the exhaust pipe, be sticking in what, like six inches in, or how how deep in? Uh, deep, the exhaust pipe of, of the generator. No, the uh, look at my screen. Can you see yeah, my screen? Right. So if you're looking at my screen, that this that's say that's the that's the exhaust of it. That's where the gas goes out. The, this yes. is the inlet. Um, how long should this pipe be into the cyclone? Halfway down or one third down or? Yeah, towards the top. Definitely towards the top. So like uh, four four fifths of the way up? Or or higher. Or higher. Um, okay. Now that out that out pipe needs to be sitting below the, the end. bottom lip. Yeah, that out pipe needs to be right about where you have it. Uh huh. And as long as it's below the bottom edge of that horizontal pipe, so you see where your mouse is right now, that yep. bottom edge of the horizontal. Yep. That's the that's that's the point where the the out pipe needs to be, and, and even add a couple inches, I would say. But Bill Pence, I mean, they have diagrams on if you stick the two six inches down with the performance. Um, and even Google searches, you'll see um, basically infrared cameras. Filming cyclone filters to see where where the friction lies, and um, so there's a lot of tech out there on this. But for the farmer, um, just having a half-ass pipe gasifier with no taper um, is going to get 90% of the filtration out if you have it sized. Uh huh. Right, and if you want a if you want a a calculator to see. I believe Stephen Avedessa has it on his site. He actually has a calculator. Oh, what's what's that site? Stephen who? Uh, the site is called northernselfreliance.com. Uh-huh. And it's northern with an N. Yep, northernselfreliance.com. Has... Yeah, N-O-R-T-H-E-R-N. Northern. Yep. Selfreliance.com has... Sizing for cyclones. Yep. Now Stephen's an engineer, classically trained engineer, and he's got several forms on his site for gasification and all kinds of stuff. And he's got this. Um, he's got a chart where he, he'll tell you how much gas you need, and what the dimensions of your of your cyclone filter should be based on. <laughs> yeah. So really helpful for the gas fire guys out there. Um, Bill Pence is a little overkill. And to be honest with you, most of the cyclone technologies and woodworking and particulate matter, OSHA stuff. Um, but for gas fire, 90% of the, of the fine dust is a really nice head start so you don't clog up the media filter. And, and you can make the media filter last longer. Yeah. Can you also wash with water the, the perlite? Yeah, I would assume so because I know people that are using um, like, uh, like oil baths and water baths to out of the gas flow, mm -hmm. for, for lack of a better term, like a bong. Okay. And, um, so I don't see why if you got the perlite damp, that it might, the only thing that comes to mind is you might reduce surface area because that water is going to fill in the void. Uh -huh. At the same time, there might be some adhesive properties with water. Um, I don't know. You might want to try it. You might want to do a test. Okay. But it certainly wouldn't hurt. It would still work. It's not going to do anything to the gas. Okay. Tell me about the butterfly valve. What What are the critical properties of that? Is that would I want to make one or get a commercial one? Is there a good commercial one for the sixteen horsepower scale? Um, are you doing two inch pipe? Yeah. So if it's let's two inch pipe, let's say we got two inch. Okay, so two inch pipe's about right. I would just get I would just get a three way ball. Well, not a three-way. Let me think. Hold on. Three-way. Three-way ball valve, yeah? No. No, in my design, I have a three-way ball valve further down. Just a just a regular two-inch, regular ball valve. 
Regular ball valve, all right. Yep, and it just sticks out like a Venturi. And on that ball valve, I would put an air filter. Oh, like well, old, I'm sorry, you cut out, you would put a filter on that? An air filter. Uh -huh. Always have an air filter. So you get dust coming in so close to the engine. From your ambient air, it kind of defeats the purpose. Uh, tell me the kind of, for a two-inch pipe, what kind of air filter? Um, I just use like a cold air intake for big cars, like a big truck. You can get them at the aftermarket park. Uh, you know, cold air intake filter. They have, it's really good breathability. And um, it's going to be a piece of cake for this thing. You know. And then what you want to do is basically have the same. So if you're running two-inch pipe, you want to have a two-inch ball. Not something because it's open to 100%. You're talking about something like this? Yeah, that's right. Something like that, or even the old-school ones that look like big old wide dish pens. Uh -huh. Any of those colder. The, do you see what the pleating does? Is it gives you, again, more surface. Yeah, yep. So I would get... I would spend a little extra money on that and put it on your butterfly valve. You should probably won't have, unless you're, you're driving around where there's a lot of dust clouds all the time, tractor. Yeah. Um, that, you might even take special precautions to protect the air filter from just being wide open to dust clouds. You might want to put a bell housing around it or something. You know, just if it's practical. Okay. You know what I'm saying, right? Just some sort of... Uh, yeah. I mean, what uh, bell housings, do they make them for those particular filters? Um, bell housing for... I've seen them. I've seen them. I don't even know if bell housing is the right term. Um, it's just... It's, it's got a... You know, it doesn't suck air in like that. So if that thing's sticking up in the air, it's going to suck air in from all sides. Yeah. But if, if you had, like, let's say, a cup around it, a gigantic drinking cup, put a bell housing over it, it's only going to suck, it's still going to suck air from all sides, but the air has to come from under it, so you're not going to catch dust clouds that are coming exactly horizontal, at least not as much. That's, I've, I've probably spent way too much time on that than it, it would even be required. Uh, like but something like this here? That one, the, I'm seeing a gray one on your screen, is that... My slow internet or uh like this this housing yeah, there you go there you go exactly so now you got something that's um dust proof pretty much and you're protecting your filter now your filter lasts a lot longer but you may have spent to... so again it's one of those different take calls that do you need a filter no do you need a housing for the filter absolutely not do you even need a filter i would say yeah i would say it would be really dumb to get cloud of dust going right into your air intake and you just damage the cylinders right just damage the cylinder and that was just that's just a type one air that you can avoid by just putting it yeah but yeah so so if you're using two inch pipe then then that ball valve is a two inch ball valve and it's probably going to be open about halfway to about three quarters but you got to figure out where exactly it is right you got to figure it out by hand or you can get or you can automate but or you get what? Or you can automate it. You can have an auto adjusting ball valve, servo. And those are available. Matt Ryder makes a, a great one. Um, ben Peterson makes one and even shows you. He even has the plans for it. So you wanna you wanna do a ball valve like this one? Yeah, those. That's a two inch ball valve. See how big and beefy it is? Yeah. Um, you kind of have to have that unless you want to go to a gate valve, which is what you were talking about, or a but, true butterfly valve. But um, I would does do does the ball the valve, valve the does the ball valve like that work as well as a as a true air valve? Um, when you say work as well, I mean gets you consistency. That means like you you don't have to adjust it, I guess. Yeah, it, it stays put. Yeah. And, but you do have to find that happy spot where it right. sounds like everything's firing. Uh, tell that's me about the name of the game. Tell me about the, the nice automation kits, the servos. What what did yep. you recommend? Alright, so I I know of three people that have these built. About four people. Steven 
an apodescent from Northern Self Reliance. He he has one. He has videos on them. Uh, in fact, you can bring up uh, Northern Self Reliance on YouTube, and I can you know. But here's how it works, Martin. You have an oxygen sensor that sits right inside your tailpipe of the generator, right? So based on the O2 reading, if you're getting high O2 levels, that means you're not getting complete combustion. Oh, okay. Add more air. So what you have is a very simple Arduino or oh, know, cool. C little program that you can yeah. say, you know, if not in this range, open it up. If close it. And um, so, so Steven's built Oh, more. yeah, this guy, yeah. Okay. He, he's a good guy, too. Steven's a very helpful guy. Okay, which which um, which video do I look at for the automation of the? Yeah, it should be. Let's see here. Gas station, cyclone. Uh, there you go. Mixer. There oh yeah, here. Yeah, right there. there. Right there. Wood gas air yes. mixer. Oh wow! So how much is one of those sensors? Is that cheap? cheap. I mean, you can build this thing for. Hey, less folks. Than Self -reliance. Oh, that's awesome. Okay. Oh, this is good. That man, because I think that's one of the it's one of those things that I mean, as the the tractor runs and gets warmed up, I mean I think you gotta kinda play with it a little bit until it gets the sweet spot, right? So this would yeah, totally this, this constantly finds the sweet spot. Oh that I think is, that's the crit that's the secret sauce right here. It is the secret sauce. Um I'm surprised Dan didn't mention it, but yeah, I mean, I didn't, I wasn't at the, the shop. Maybe it was just getting the thing up and running with it. But this really comes into play, like on the second or third shop, you know, if you're doing like a gasification series, because this is what gets into where it really makes sense. Yeah. Especially if you're driving, because sometimes you have to be on idle. When you're on idle, you're not sucking the same air through that cherry hot charcoal zone. And so what happens is your oxidation zone shrinks. And then when you when when the light turns green and you have to hit pedal to the metal, yeah, you can't you can't get that kind of instant reaction like you can with gasoline because you can't produce the gas because the, the hot part got too small. Uh huh. So, Would the, does the valve help a lot with that? The automation on that? The automation ha helps a lot with that. And then what I was what I was leading with that last point was there are some guys that actually will if it's if you're you're at it idle too long, it'll like artificially rev up the engine and keep, you know, that's getting way out of this one. But, um, but yeah, I mean, just, just that auto stoichiometric mixer is ideal because you don't have to have some guy man in the ball valve to find the sweet spot. Wow. Okay. So let's talk about the Arduino oxygen sensor Arduino. That's, let's see, is that affordable? Yeah, five I, bucks. I remember all this being under, under Let's see. What about the probe? Um, the probe would be the sensor. It's a little, yeah, it's like a little metal toothpick thing that hangs out of a wire. It just depends. I mean, now, and I, you know, with, with modern electronics now, the boards that they have that are coming out like have everything on them, so there might be OT sensors just right on. But um, you do, or excuse me, the sense, not the sensor, not the probe, but the component. The probe you're going to probably have to buy. And a probe, tell me about the probe. Uh, so it would be, it's called an oxygen probe? Yeah, just an O2 sensor. They have them on all cars. You know, it's the same thing they have on cars to, to let the, the car computer, you know, adjust the engine to get a better mix. Uh, do you know how those things work? What, what do they actually measure? What are they... Well, the O2 sensor measures measures the oxygen that's in the exhaust gas coming out of your tail. Right, and and do you know how 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 that happens? Uh, I don't know the science behind it, but I know that. Um, okay. Yeah. yeah. Well, it it looks like uh, thirty bucks for that. Yep. Oxygen probe. And I've seen them for a hundred, and I've seen them for ten. So, you know, a lot of the AliExpress and Alibaba stuff are cheaper. Nice. So yeah, this is um, yeah, this should I definitely would probably not have even gotten into gas condition had I thought some dude had to be on the mall valve. It's just really not that practical. Um, 
this gives it some level of self self control. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Have you implemented this? I have. But Steven makes a really good one. Yeah, sorry, sorry, you have or you haven't? I have not. Have not, okay. But, but, but my ex partner has. Okay. Actually, Steve was an ex partner first. And then my most recent was uh, was Matt Ryder. And Matt's in Michigan, he's not too far from you. Mm -hmm. And Matt Ryder owns uh, Thrive Energy Systems. So he's a, probably the one competitor for All Power Lab. And it's his website, is Thrive Energy Systems. He also makes a bigger, beefier, more, I would say, more commercial version than Steven's video. Mm -hmm. and, see, and Ben Peterson also makes a really, Ben Peterson's a master, well, both Ben and Matt are master uh, fabricators. So both of those look beefy, they're pretty, they're really well made. Steven's probably one of the cheaper ones you can get made. And then I partnered with um, Todd Harpster, who is a, sort of a permaculture builder guy. I met him at PV2. Todd yeah. Harpster? Todd Harpster. Yeah, and he's in, he's in Minnesota. And he has all the gas, all our gas fires in his garage, actually. So is, th is he actually continuing, or? No. Todd was a client. Todd bought one of the cross fires. Mm -hmm. And um, then he also has the prototype. And there's, you know, since we're no longer in business, they're sitting in his garage. I don't know what he's, what he's doing with them. But, uh, but yeah, and he was going, and he was designing our, uh, our version of the air mixture. And he was using our, an Arduino and the little circo motor that came built on top of a, of a ball valve from China. So it had a circo motor, like it was already meant to be oh, like wow. a, And then he was just going to use the Arduino to tell it when to open and close. Yeah. But you can check out all those... Um, all those courses, and of course, you need emails and phone numbers. That's great. Hold on one second, Mark. I just got a message for this one. Let me read it real quick. Okay, that's not. Yeah, man. So, um, you might also want to check out this is really cool. There's a forum out there called Drive On Wood. Yeah. And the moderator of that whole forum is a guy named Chris. And Chris is good friends with Wayne. You know, Wayne, Mr. Woodgas himself. And uh, Chris is, uh, his name is Chris Sainz, S-A-E-N-Z, I believe. I can, I'm sorry, man, I don't have that up. But anyway, Chris um, has in his truck a diaphragm thing in the jig that I have. I completely have no understanding how it works, but somehow he's using the neck, the pressure, and then I'll tell you what, pro I probably won't even do it justice to describe it, but let me send you a link offline. But he's got something that does like auto mixing with a, like a diaphragm. It's like this two sided diaphragm thing where if it's pulling hard, it lets more air in. If it's pulling soft, it lets. So it's almost like an auto mixer without any of the electronics. Okay. It's just using sort of physics and, you know. But it's been so long, man, I, I can't really speak on it with any certainty. Yep, 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 yep. Yeah. Yeah, you don't even need a big servo, man. Just this little map, you know, this little RV car servos. Because if you put it on like a, like a rack and pin gearbox where you get a lot of revolutions with, with the torque you can use you can get away with a tiny servo you just, it has to do a lot more revolutions to get to open up the servo but you really don't need it to be super sensitive like open you're really just fine tuning it anyway like right you know 30 second of a turn here and a third you know so to me it would make more sense to invest in a smaller servo motor with get the gear ratio down so it could turn even something as stiff as a, as a two-inch ball, which does take some, take some bumps. Yeah. Okay. Uh, but, yeah, but all these guys have done it, and um, it's all in the two-inch range. Okay. It should be a perfect, you could eyeball it, and uh, Ned Peterson shows you how to make it. It's a walkthrough. 
Um, let's see, Ned Peterson. Uh, ben Peterson. Ben Peterson. I think it's called goodgasplans.com. Shows you how to make the the ball the ball valve servo. He's selling books, and in the books, and in a video that I've seen, I don't know if it was a teaser. Again, this stuff is like two years old. My all, all this stuff that I'm talking about. Uh, ben Peterson is what? What's his website? I'm trying to verify that right now. Woodgasifierplans.com. Sorry, woodgasifierplans.com? Now, when you get there, scroll halfway down the page so you get to see two uh, black book covers. These are the books that he wrote, and one's the Wood Gas Fire Bible, and the other one is the Electronic Carburetor Workshop. This is what I'm talking about. It's a work of art. It's just an amazing magician with metal, and it's free function. Um, Electronic carburetor workshop, you mean for wood gas? For wood gas. If you're on that page, that's that's what we just went through. The, that's the uh, O2 sensor. He's calling it an electronic carburetor. It's, it is a carburetor. Oh, yeah. Hey, I made an open source electronic carburetor. That's what I'm talking about. So, yeah. there you go. Um, did he open source this? No, no, I'm just saying that's what we'll say in the future. It sounds good. Yeah, and of course, I mean, these guys with the wood, I mean, has anyone yet actually made one that lasts without gumming up the engine? I mean, is the actual gasifier kit from All Power Labs, I mean, they're actually working in long-term duration uh, track record, or? Now, my understanding and my belief, because I've been up there, I've been to their workshops, and I know, I know those guys, and... My belief is it's the best small-scale gasifier on the planet, and the only thing that will be up to it is Matt Ryder's unit. Because Ben Peterson, this guy right here, doesn't do this anymore. He's out. He's out of the business. So he's like me. Um, gasification as a business isn't as uh, you know. It's more of a hobby. Let's put it that way. So I think Ben's just reaching out making a little bit of money by selling his books and sharing his knowledge. He's, he's doing other things now. But those three guys, it was Ben's old Victory gasifier, Matt's Pride Energy System gasifiers, and All Power Labs. Now, Matt's and All Power Labs are, are very similar in performance. Um, Matt's actually gives you get a little bit more of the button. The question is, and he's a great fabricator. He's, he's, a, he's he builds robots. The guy's just a great fabricator. So what you have, you know, not to change this conversation, but in my opinion, what you have is a maverick in, in Matt, basically a metal savant that just understands how, he just understands. Hey, hey all this is Matt. Oh, no, workshop. Systems. And, uh, and, and, and with All Power Labs, you have more of your traditional um, startup where they hacked it, they made a name for themselves, and you know, that they have a real staff. They've also taken a lot of them. Um, I, I can't verify this, but I've heard they've taken grant money, which can, you know, which is fine. It helps make something last. But I know from from my experience, Matt's a one a one man shop, and so um, it's hard to say. Yeah, I I think if you're gonna do biomass and not charcoal, one of those two machines, if you're gonna buy it, would be the best. If you're gonna build it. In, in cheap is the name of the game. Maybe Ben Peterson's Wood Gas Fire Bible. Of course, uh, Drive on Wood. You have uh, Wayne Keith's Gas Fire. You know, the, that's his mm -hmm. website. His Gas Fire is for 50 bucks. Those are they're all good. Listen, I've seen I've seen dozens of different Gas Fire designs, and almost all of them work pretty good. Um, the, when you're talking about wood gas and charcoal gas. That's to me the dividing line because because you can filter the hell out of biomass gas and you can have the same clean as the whistle gas as it would with charcoal. That's not to me. That's not the point. It's 
not about gumming up the engine, although that is an aspect. To me, it's the fact that I can get hydrogen from carbon where I can't get as much from wood gas. Because wood gas, whatever water is baked into the wood, uh -huh. um, sort of gets vaporized and it gets converted into, you know, into hydrogen with the gasification process. With charcoal gas station, we're purposely injecting it at, at much higher range much higher rates than you are in wood gas. Like we're doing it on purpose. I'm sticking basically a high pressure water nozzle. I shouldn't say that. It's not even a nozzle. It's literally just vapor that's coming out of the same air pipe. We're just letting uh, it wrap around the hot zone. So a couple trips around and it's steam in no time. And so steam will catch a ride with the path of least resistance. So it catches a ride with the air and just kind of piggybacks in with the air. That's how we've done it. That's how Kuhn does it. And that's how Gary Gilmore does it. Now you don't have to use water or steam. You can use exhaust gas recirculation. The reason I like using water is because it does something that the exhaust gas doesn't do. Number one, yes, you do get a buffer. You do prevent those runaway temperatures that if you, did, if you just were putting air on charcoal, um, you get temperatures that are much hotter than they need to be. So by putting in, you, you have that gas buffer. The other thing you get is hydrogen. <laughs> right. And, and how much percent do, do you claim to be getting? You, you, you mentioned, I believe, 20% additional free power from the water? 10 to 20%, and it really depends. We haven't measured it because it never got to the point where we could literally do a gas chromatograph test mm -hmm. on any of this stuff. That's really expensive, and we just we just weren't funded, and you know how that goes. So, so yeah, I mean, so if you want to dilute it to cool your gas fire down a little bit with the exhaust gas, that's great. You, you got two benefits: you're cooling the gas, and you're reducing the CO2 emissions a little bit. But then again, this, the CO2 is going back in the system to get broken down again. So it's 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 not like a closed loop. You're, you're only sort of reusing half of the gas before it goes back out. Um, you could do the same thing with water. But with water, the, the benefit is you, you get a really, really explosive gas. I don't want to scare anyone, but um, because it's in small amounts, but when you have, let's say, 10% hydrogen mixed with, you know, 30%, 40%, carbon monoxide. Uh, well, let's put it this way. <clears throat> if I was just burning carbon monoxide in a cylinder on a 3600 RPM engine, it's not going to keep up. The flame front is just not fast enough on carbon monoxide. And there's not enough power. It's just, it's just the two chain molecules, carbon and you know, oxygen. You're splitting one thing. There's not a lot of energy resistance, right? Yeah. So you better be burning all of that up. And it, and it won't. It's not flammable. Just like um, biogas, you know, car will do it, but your car is like 220, you know, 2200 RPM. It's when you start getting up into the higher RPMs that the wood gas won't keep up. And you have to adjust your timing on your yeah. car plug. So with hydrogen, you have the opposite problem, which I love, because just 10% hydrogen at let everything that's in there that's going to burn is going to instantly burn completely, uh, just completely. It's hydrogen. It burns 10 times faster than any known element in the universe, you know, gas. 10 times faster. So it acts almost like a wick, like a kindling for these slower gases. Because it's not like there's one spark that's emanating out. It's almost like instant combustion. So because of that, instead of um, enhancing your, your spark plug, timing, you're retarding it. You're actually waiting till the it gets to close to top dead center where you have more compression of those gases. And then you're lighting that spark in your engine right at the last second, right before the top dead center. And because it's hydrogen, it will burn all and it, so you get a 10, 20 percent more efficient burn. No more power than you would if you weren't doing it. But a 10 to 20 percent more efficient burn with hydrogen burning all of it. It's acting like a wick for all those other slower burning gases. So for me, hydrogen has that extra benefit of being more, getting more gas mileage. 
Yeah. And then the engine timing is per just perfect for running the wood. It was with us. If you've seen our video, um, our engine, I don't know if you've seen it. I don't have it up anymore. It is archived. You can find it. Our engine was, was peaked out and it was just humming perfectly. Uh huh. And does that mean. I mean, that means you were getting more power out of the same gas, too, then. Not power, right? So that's a, I thought so, too, in the beginning. But yeah, it's hydrogen, more power. It's not more power. Right? And I have a gas chart here that has hydrogen, carbon monoxide, and some of these really light gases. Okay. Um, okay, but it's, but it's usable power. You still use, you're burning, absolutely, but you're... Absolutely. Right, it's absolutely. usable power. Yeah. Yeah, what I'm saying is, is you're not going to get any more power than if you were doing just carbon monoxide than carbon monoxide with hydrogen. They're going to be the same power, but you're going to get more efficient burns with the one with hydrogen. In other words, translated to engine shaft power, the engine shaft power is higher. Right? Gosh. Well, no. because because you're burning it at the better point in the compression cycle, that means you're actually tapping that energy instead of that energy kind of going right. to waste. You're more efficient on the engine because of less friction on the cylinder head because with advanced timing, excuse me, uh, retard, advanced timing, you're fine. The piston head's like not even close to top dead center. So you're actually yeah, fighting, but, fighting the compression, right? Fighting the compression and you're yeah. causing friction and it's totally anti- Right, 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 exactly. Yeah, yeah. So that's why I'm a big hydrogen fan. Not I see. Because, because a lot of people are like, well, you're, you know, you don't need to put in water, you can just reuse it. Great, if you're, if, if you're looking at, at an emission standpoint, they're the same. Right. Okay. With hydrogen, it's water. you just have water dripping out of it. Yeah. It's, it's, it's actually really lovely when you see water dripping out of the tailpipe and you're breathing it in with a big... And it just smells wonderful. And you realize all cars can be like that. And you realize there's not enough biomass to make it happen. <laughs> uh-huh. So, but, uh, wait, let's, let's see. When you have pure carbon as charcoal as the fuel, then the products of pyrolysis there are ca carbon monoxide and water? No, if you're burning charcoal, if it's a charcoal gas fire, and you're only pulling in ambient air, the, the gasification process will take oxygen from the air and carbon from the, the physical pieces of the charcoal, mm -hmm. and it will convert them in a process called the oxidation reduction process that changes that into carbon monoxide instead of, uh, well, there's two things that happen. It first changes the carbon and the oxygen to CO2. And then with a little bit different heat, it splits those. And another carbon jumps onto that CO2, and then it becomes unstable, and then you get two hydrogen uh, carbon monoxide molecules. Uh -huh. so, and a carbon monoxide is what burns. Carbon monoxide is what burns. Carbon dioxide is, is absolutely not flammable because it already... And that goes yeah. into the engine, too, so that just comes for the ride? Yeah, carbon dioxide just comes for the ride, but it also gets converted, right? So the car, so there's um, there's two processes going on. I have uh, okay. there's, you, know, you basically have oxidation. That's right where your your nozzle incoming air is coming in. It's lit up cherry red or cherry white. Um, it's actually a white, machine. and that's where everything is basically thermally broken down into very small monoatomic elements and short chain short chain molecules. And then it's precisely after that point in the reduction zone where it's a little bit cooler. Uh-huh. Sorry, you cut out there on me. And it becomes more stable at C at C O. So it's really two processes happening. We just call it you know gasification oxidation and and uh, reduction now if you're running biomass of course you're doing drying you're doing pyrolysis you're doing oxidation and reduction so there's four things that you have to consider and that's where you get the tar gases and the sticky da, 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 da. but hey look if you don't have an efficient way to make the biochar or to make the charcoal feedstock um, there's nothing wrong with biomass gasification I just have gotten spoiled because charcoal just always works. Right, it always works. And then 
So you don't think the, the issues there with the gumming up of the engines are there? That's not an issue? Zero issue with, with charcoal gas. No, 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 but not with charcoal, but I'm saying with wood. Yeah, it definitely is there. It's definitely there. And you really do have to have extensive filtration to get it out. And, and has, so have the all power labs guys solved that? From my understanding, I, they're, they're more recent units from what I'm hearing are solved. Their old units were good. Um, I had, I've heard a couple of complaints that, um, some of the, the older units, I don't want to bring up any names, cause it, but some of the older units were what they are, older prototypes that weren't as good as the new ones. In a, in a space that's just totally absent of inventors. I mean, it's, this is just a big void. Yeah. Because guys like me can step in and make a name for themselves just by tinkering around. I mean, it's just a big void yeah. space. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Well, this this is great. So this is a lot of info. So what I'll do is I'll, I'll come up with a new conceptual design for our conceptual slash technical design for our next iteration. I'll run okay. it by you. See if you can provide some feedback on it. Um, are you familiar with the Duramax 16 horsepower at all? No, I mean, not really. Because I'm wondering what changes it have to be for the air intake, but I'll just take a look at what I have here, see if there's an easy way. Uh, it seems like it will be easy just to connect to the air intake and that's it. Just like we did the last time, we just busted through the plastic. Busted through the plastic, and usually you have to, what we done in the past is we weld a plate yeah so we have a mating plate where you know, there's nothing that screws in we just we literally match two pieces of thick sheet metal and bolt it together for the for a total seal almost yeah. like a flange type seal yeah so i would i would suggest um if you can't fabricate a really good one maybe consider buying a commercial gas connector like we did on with the crossfire the hosing we use is like all commercial gas applications. Really thick rubber hose, you know what I'm talking about? Um, they have all those um, cam and groove nozzles that, which is what we use. Cam and groove nozzles? For mating to the. Yeah, I mean, you can even just take. weld it on. Well, but it's plastic there, though. It doesn't have metal there. I mean, if you took the plastic box off, uh huh. You know, eventually there's the, the yeah. air intake is going to be metal. So if you could, if you could weld it onto that, or if you come up with a mating plate that's like a flange, it doesn't have to be, you know, a circular flange. And when it works, it can just be a square flange just to hold, it, just to get that seal. It's the seal you want. Yeah, cam and groove coupling. Um, yeah, that's probably not the word for it. Uh, it's a quick connect. It's like commercial industrial. There you go. That's it right there. Those things? That thing right there? Yeah, that's what we use. Which uh, which thing? Like this the, one? For the hose, yeah. Now, if you're talking about the actual seating the mount onto the generator, it either has to be welded or... The, the okay. Plate. But that's what we use. Okay. And this is, this is all the, you know, all the uh, Boeing 747. That's... They fill up with this kind of stuff. Okay. So, so um, a little bit overkill. I mean, you can just use a regular. No, I like it. That's a that's a good airtight connection. We could also try three D printing something out if we want to design that. Yeah, I I don't have the time nor the skills for the three D stuff, but I can I can show anybody on the team that might. Yeah, yeah. No, we, we could do that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean this this talking stuff is really easy. For I have purple tunnel, and I make my living online, so yeah. a lot, large amounts of typing are just are really, really killing me, so this is great if I can just talk. <laughs> yeah, no, this is good. This is really good. Okay, okay, so we get busy on this, and um, yeah, so let's maybe talk, talk like, um, can we do this Friday? Absolutely. Okay. Let me, let me say one other thing, too. One of the best things that I ever did on my other design and it was copied, and it's it's actually, I think, it's more used than it's not, was the nozzles that we use. And the nozzles that we use, 
no one seems to be using it. Everyone has melted nozzles after a month. Hey, look at my stainless steel nozzle got melted. Time for a new one. I never had that problem. Right. Because the nozzles I use were aluminum nozzles for welding TIG covers. Uh-huh. And those are perfect nozzles because they're... How do you screw them on, though, to, to the thread? It's a machine thread. It's not MPT. So the alumina TIG cup nozzle machine thread. And if you're doing a two-inch gas, then I'd probably get a three-quarter inch opening. There's your, there's your reduced air nozzle opening to get that velocity. Um... And, and how do I get the machine thread? Where, where does that come from? You, you got to go to a parts store and get a get a pipe nipple that's machine threaded. Oh, okay, machine thread. What's yeah, machine, machine thread? thread I think it's I think it's it's, it's finer threads. The sliding on the threads are a you know, much shallower angle, and it's all for more of a complete uh, fit, like a more surface area, more fit, more of a fit. Yeah, NPTs, you're just big old goofy hose type threads. Machine threads are more interesting. Uh, but yeah, if you just type in TIG cup aluminum nozzle, they're everywhere. You can get them in any gas store. And despite people saying them being fragile, we never broke ours. And I dumped hundreds of pounds of charcoal over the top of it, and it was literally just hanging out in the middle of the air inside the... Those, I mean, Martin, if, of any of the bright ideas we've ever had, my partners and I when we were, was, hey, what can we use for the nozzle that yeah. heat? And then Jared being a welder goes, why don't we use a tick cup? And it was just like a no-brainer. Right. And, and is there I like, yeah. is there a particular size of a tick cup? Like here in my view right here is six, seven, eight, size eight. Is that? Now, here, so I'm going to, what you need is a, is a, is a nozzle calculator. A nozzle what? calculator it says it's an excel spreadsheet that Ku and Ben looked in and put once together that tries to find the exact opening for the nozzle based on nozzle velocity 25 meters per second and your cubic air displacement of your engine so he's got a little cell calculator that says what's your first of all what's your rpm of your engine say 3600 okay what's the cc or the, you know, if you have a big engine, what's the liter displacement? 4.2 liters, 5.2, you know what I mean? If it's a smaller engine, it's probably in cc's. And he can say, to get 25 meters per second, it'll tell you what size your alumina or your nozzle opening needs to be. Fantastic little calculator from, a, from an engineer. Uh, where is that? Um, I have it somewhere. It's a Google Doc or a Google Sheet. He shared with me that I will share with you. Okay. Uh, I mean, literally, I have dozens of folders, all kinds of stuff with the application in it, and uh, I'll need to sort of sort that out to get you some of this. Excellent. Okay, let's talk. Let's check in next Friday. Sounds good, Marchin. Hey, appreciate. It. I got to jump on the call too, so this is a great time. Oh, this is great, man. Thanks a lot for this dump of good knowledge. We'll uh, make no it work. Problem. Okay. Love what you're doing. Thank you, Troy. Talk soon. Talk to you soon. Bye-bye.